Hi, I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park, and welcome to the fourth in our series of virtual wildflower walks celebrating our native woodland wildflowers. Today we are at Rapidan Camp, which was the weekend retreat for President Herbert Hoover and Lou Henry Hoover, the First Lady. They would spend some weekends here fishing, horseback riding, walking, hiking, but also doing some work uh, from, their, of, <laughs> from their duties in, in their office. Uh, but uh, there's more about Rapid Ant Camp that you can find out about on our park website. That's www.nps.gov slash Shen. And you can even take a virtual tour of Rapid Ant Camp from there. But we're not here to talk about Rapid Ant Camp. We're here to talk about wildflowers. And we're at one of the lower elevations here. It's about 2,500 feet. I guess it's kind of a middle elevation. And this is where the wildflowers are blooming. So let's take a walk and see what we can find. This is a very tiny flower. It's one that we don't see just everywhere in the park, but it's a, it's a nice spring native flower. This is called foam flower. And the flowers are just teeny tiny little white flowers, but they're just delightful. And because we don't have them everywhere in the park, it's, it's just, it's kind of nice to see them. So blooming right here in the shade, uh, which they prefer uh, here at Rapid Ann Camp, uh, foam flower. Tiarella is its Latin name. And uh, not much more that I can say about it, except it's just a beautiful, tiny little flowering plant um, to come across. Just a lovely thing to, to find in the springtime. We're looking at some ferns that are just coming up. Springtime is the time when the ferns kind of rejuvenate after being uh, uh, kind of asleep for the winter. And they'll put up new fronds. Uh, this is a Christmas fern. And you notice how the leaves or the fronds are unfurling in this curling rounded uh, form that looks like the end of a violin and and hence their that shape is called a fiddlehead now there's no such thing as a fiddlehead fern but there are a lot of different ferns that will open in this way that they have a fiddlehead look at the uh, at the tips um, so christmas ferns are one they're a very common fern um, but a lot of our other ferns will also be unfurling this way. Now, I know uh, a lot of people are tempted to, to pick fiddleheads from ferns uh, to cook, but remember in our national parks, all of our plants are protected. So, except for those few fruits, nuts, berries, and a uh, few, few mushroom species. So please do not in Shenandoah National Park pick fiddleheads. Um, it's illegal to do that. It also prevents those ferns from ever growing out so it reduces the population of the ferns so uh, please enjoy the ferns especially as they're in their fiddlehead form right now as they're just unfurling it's an amazing um, uh, look uh, and uh, you can get some really interesting photos of these uh, ferns with their fiddleheads so uh, just please leave them uh, where you find them for others to enjoy We're standing next to a shrub. It's, it's not real handsome. It's kind of got some dead branches on it and not a whole lot of leaves, but this is a special shrub. This is the Rose Bay rhododendron. And unlike the Catawba rhododendrons that have the purple flowers that you may be used to seeing along the Blue Ridge Parkway, this has white flowers, the Rose Bay rhododendron. Um, Shenandoah National Park doesn't have a lot of the Catawba, the purple rhododendrons. We also don't have a lot of the Rose Bay rhododendrons, but this is one place where they were known a long time ago. These Rose Bay rhododendrons with the white flowers used to be called the Great Laurel, even though, you know, it's not Mount Laurel, it's a rhododendron, but that was what it was called in the olden days. and just upstream up the laurel prong and as you cross over the fork mountain trail goes over that laurel prong um, there is a small forest of these um, and it's the only known colony of these in Shenandoah National Park and they bloom around the 4th of July so if you're down here around Rapid Ann Camp around the 4th of July, just go upstream a little ways, cross over to the beginning of the Fork Mountain Trail and look for these in bloom. This one is the only one that's in Rapid Ann Camp 
proper, where Herbert Hoover and, and Lou Henry Hoover, the first lady, um, came on their weekends. Now, this one was most likely moved from upstream and planted here in this area that was uh, uh, conducive to it, it wasn't from too far away but it's the only one here in the camp right now so this continues to bloom even though it's looking a little straggly these days um, around the fourth of july this one may be blooming as well so keep your eyes open for the rose bay rhododendron there aren't very many of them we've got some beautiful wild strawberry flowers growing right up here against this background of a nice greenstone rock they're enjoying that that radiant uh that sun that's uh that's hitting that rock and and warming up the, the surrounding uh, area there. Uh, wild strawberries, very much like the garden strawberries that you may grow at home. You'll notice the leaves are the same. They're three leaflets with uh, teeth on them. Beautiful five-petaled white flowers. Strawberries are um, a member of the rose family, as are most of our um, uh, soft fruits, pears, apples. I guess they're not so soft, but our uh, uh, peaches, apples, pears, uh, strawberries. All members of the rose family, they'll all have five petals. Um, but uh, the strawberry flower, uh, once it's done its work of attracting a pollinator, just like other flowers, those petals will fall off when they're not needed anymore to, to attract. And right in the center, where you see all the little, little anthers and pistils in there, that's going to be where the strawberry fruit will, will grow. So the strawberries that will grow on here are going to taste just like other strawberries that you might find in a store. Some say even better, but they're going to be much smaller, only about a half an inch or so uh, long and very sweet. Uh, they're at just the right uh, height for um, small uh, animals here. Um, so other mammals like rabbits may, may uh, enjoy those, but certainly our box turtles uh, like to, to eat the wild strawberries, and I'm sure there's a, a variety of birds that will eat them as well. Now, this is one of the uh, types of uh, plant foods that you are allowed to eat here in Shenandoah National Park. So you can pick the wild strawberries along with uh, later on in the season when our blackberries bloom and our blueberries, you can pick those to eat, but just enough for your personal consumption. So be sure and leave plenty behind for the wildlife. got a lovely patch of large flowered trillium. This is one of the most uh, highly anticipated of our spring wildflowers when people are looking for them to start blooming. And one of the reasons is that they're so large, relatively large. You can see by my hand that um, they're not huge, but many of our wildflowers are smaller than this. Um, large flowered trillium because it does have a fairly large flower. It's got three petals um, and three very interesting leaflets that are set equal, equally apart on the stem. Um, they can look like jack-in-the-pulpit leaves when they uh, are first coming up, but uh, we'll see if we can find some jack-in-the-pulpits and we may be able to show you the difference uh, later. But Trillium, a member of the lily family, beautiful large white flowers, and usually whenever they first come out of their buds, they'll be a, a nice uh, white, though they might have a pinkish tinge to them. And then as they begin to fade, as they get older, their petals will turn pinkish. And some of them will be a very, very pink uh, color before they're finished. And once they're, they're finished, that means the flower has probably been pollinated and the petals have done their work in trying to attract a bee and saying, hey, I'm over here, come and, and pollinate me. And um, they don't need the petals anymore. Once that flower is pollinated, petals fall off and then that seed will form uh, later. Now, not every um, uh, trillium plant is going to have a flower this year. Sometimes it takes up to 10 years for one flower to be produced, uh, the first flower to be produced on a trillium plant. So it takes a lot of energy to make that big flower. And so sometimes those roots are just taking up nutrients for years before they can um, uh, make a big flower. But a uh, very pretty, one of our most popular flowers in the park, the large flowered trillium. 
it's in a bed uh, here of other trilliums, but also you'll see some single leaves sticking up like these. These is, this is another member of the lily family, and this is called the Mayflower, Canada Mayflower. And they'll have a flower coming up on a stem, nice little white flower. And again, not every one of these Mayflower leaves is going to have uh, a flower this year. They spend a lot of time making energy to produce uh, flowers. This is a wonderful little spot here. We've got some other things going on. Uh, we've got um, some leaves here of an orchid. This orchid is called the rattlesnake plantain, and it will have a stem about this high with small white flowers on it. So orchids are not very common uh, wherever they grow. You see there's just this one little group right here, and um, also very interesting flowers. But this particular one, the rattlesnake plantain, has sort of a checkerboard, uh, almost a checkerboard uh, effect on its leaves, where the leaves are dark green and the veins are small and white, and they have this wonderful distinctive pattern. That's the rattlesnake plantain, and that will be blooming in another month, uh, maybe six weeks or so uh, from there. From here. I found something else that was kind of interesting. If we can, where did I see that? Now, oh, be careful. Be careful where you step whenever you're looking for wildflowers because you might be stepping on one. And right here behind us we have a jack-in-the-pulpit. Um, this is not a lily but a member of another family called the Aram family and a very distinctive flower on a stalk. Um, inside is um, a pillar right there. Isn't that interesting? And at the very base of that will be the, the um, male flower parts or the female flower parts. On Jack in the Pulpits, they're on separate plants. So this one happens to be a male uh, Jack in the Pulpit. How can you tell? It's only got one leaf stem. Here's the stem coming up, and here's the three leaflets. We talked about how the trillium can fool you into thinking it's a Jack in the Pulpit when it's before it's opened up with a flower because the leaves are similar. But if you look at the Jack in the Pulpit leaves, you've got one coming up and two kind of at an angle, whereas the trillium leaves are going to be equally at an equal angle all the way around the stem. So trillium, Jack in the Pulpit. The uh, Jack in the Pulpit flowers have an interesting ability to uh, change from year to year from male to female. So it uh, takes more nutrients to, to make uh, female, uh, to, to make seeds. And so once a Jack in the Pulpit plant has gotten a lot of nutrients, it may be able to form those, uh, those female parts and there'll be two leaf stems coming out. So, um, but on the male flowers, it's one leaf stem on the females two on Jack in the Pulpit. And we like to joke around and say that the single leaf males are Jack and the two leaf females are Jill. So we've got Jack in the Pulpits and Jill in the Pulpits. That's not official, that's just kind of a, of a fun way to think about it. I just love a mossy log like this because a lot of other plants will come in and find a nice place to grow. And one of those is this pretty little violet. Um, this is the Northern White Violet very small, uh, much smaller than our common blue violet, for instance, the one that you're, you see most often in the park. But as we've said before, violets come in a variety of color. Violet is one of colors. Violet is one of those. And uh, we've seen yellow violets in the past. And uh, here's a beautiful small white one. Um, these ones are among the smallest of the violet flowers. And there are other white ones. Probably the one you're most likely to run into here in the park is the Canada violet. And that's going to be about twice the size of this northern white violet. Uh, the Canada violet, if you look at the back of the petals on those, there'll be, a, there'll be a purple blush on the back of those petals. This northern white violet is all white. Uh, very small, but it has the same features of other violets. It's got the little bee runway in the very center, little purple lines that direct the, the bees right to where the pollen is inside. On the back of the flower, like other violets, they have a, um, a little spur and that's where the nectar is. So our northern white violet, beautiful little plant growing here on the moss, uh, one of our early spring wildflowers. We've got another violet here. It's uh, 
a yellow violet. It's one of those violets that isn't a violet color, but a very pretty um, small yellow flower on this violet. It's the downy yellow violet because the stem is very uh, slightly slightly hairy. Um, we have a smooth yellow violet here as well, and you can guess what its stem looks like, nice and smooth. Um, but the downy yellow violet has the same feature that other violets have. It has those bee runways, so when the bee lands on the petal, there are lines on that petal that direct the bee right to where the pollen is, uh, right to where the nectar is, and they have to pass through the pollen to get to the nectar that's kept in the back of that spur uh, like other violets have. So the downy yellow violets are uh, blooming right now this spring here in Chenando. got an interesting plant here. It's not blooming yet, but we get a lot of questions about this one in the springtime as these leaves are coming up. This is called false hellebore. Uh, Veratrum viridi is its Latin name, but it's a member of the lily family. It won't have a large lily flower uh, like the trillium flower. It, instead, it will have a stalk coming up with a bunch of small whitish greenish uh, flowers that are not as noticeable as the leaves on these. Um, they'll bloom uh, uh, several weeks from now. But um, the interesting thing is they look like corn almost coming up the way these leaves are pleated. And another name for this is the corn lily. Um, one thing that you need to be careful about with a lot of plants is that they're poisonous, and this one is. You never want to eat any part of the corn lily or false hellebore. Um, in fact, that's a good uh, thing to remember in a national park like Shenandoah, our plants are all protected, so um, it's illegal to, to cut any of the parts off of a plant to, to eat them. Now, there's an exception for fruits, nuts, and berries, and certain mushrooms. Uh, you would go to our park web page, um, our website, to find out more detailed information. You can also ask a ranger uh, if you see a ranger around. But uh, leave all of our plants parts attached, and that way you're safe and the plant is safe to, to reproduce. This is a native plant, uh, and it's a very beautiful, distinctive plant. You find them growing around wet areas like streams, seepage areas, um, and marshy places. So that is um, false hellebore or corn lily. We've got a, a cheery yellow flower here. Our buttercups have just started to open up. A uh, nice spring welcoming flower. We have a lot of different kinds of buttercups in, in Shenandoah National Park. Um, a lot of them are not native, um, but this one is. This is the early buttercup. It's early. It's one of the first ones to, to open up in the springtime. And on a lot of buttercups, um, you may notice that their, their petals are very close together. And on the early buttercup, there's gaps between the petals. So that's, a, that's one way to tell them. But uh, I like buttercups because of that bright yellow color very shiny. Um, one of the reasons that it has that bright shine, shiny color is that underneath the, the yellow, uh, the petals are white. So it helps to, to produce that bright glowing yellow um, and making this one of our most um, welcome uh, uh, wildflowers in the spring to see because they're just so bright and, uh, and welcoming. In the early spring, along, especially along roadsides like this, we are seeing some uh, bright yellow flowers. And this happens to be a non-native flower. It's called common wintercress or yellow rocket. It's a member of the mustard family. And these non-native uh, flowers prefer a little more full sunlight. So, um, and they, they do well in disturbed soils, like along roadsides or ditches or things like that. We don't often find them blooming in the woods where a lot of our other native wildflowers are. So they don't really necessarily cause that much of a problem. So as far as being an invasive, they tend to invade places like these road edges. Um, so we're not too worried about these guys. They're not on our uh, public enemies list of non-native um, uh, invasive flowers, but um, they also do attract some pollinators, uh, very small ones, um, because the flowers are so small. 
and as a mustard the uh, the greens would have been edible so these flowers have been around for a long time people who lived in the mountains would have used those uh, mustard greens and cooked them like you would cook uh, other mustard greens today uh, mustard flowers have four petals um, instead of the more common five or more and so it's a, it's a good way to kind of zero in on what kind of a family of flowers you're looking at so uh, they are actually very pretty little yellow flowers. This is the common wintercress or yellow rocket. One of our earliest flowers to bloom in the park is coltsfoot. It's not a native flower. It comes from Europe, but it's a beautiful, cheerful yellow flowering plant. Looks a bit like dandelions. They're related. They're in the composite family, but they have very different leaves, and that's why this is called coltsfoot. We have a leaf over here that looks just like a, a little horse hoof and um, hence colt's foot. But what happens is these leaves don't come out until after the flowers bloom. And then after the flowers are pollinated, that stem will grow, extend, and form these seed heads just like, whoa, <laughs> the wind just took those away, just like um, dandelions um, do. And yeah, we'll see if we can show you what we mean at the the base of there, that fluff are some seeds and uh, the wind will just carry them off. Now once the flowers have gone to seed, then you'll start to see the leaves. So the leaves that we're seeing here are from flowers that have already bloomed um, and, and gone to seed. So first the flowers come up, then they go to seed, and you'll start to see those leaves. That's Colt's foot. On this nice sunny bank here, we've got a very unusual looking flower. This is called wood betony, B-E-T-O-N-Y. And its flowers bloom from the bottom up. So these ones here have just started to open up and then it will bloom in a spiral all the way up to the top. So these have just begun to bloom. They'll be either a yellow or a maroon or yellow and maroon. <laughs> This one has a little tinge of maroon on the upper petal and yellow down below. The flowers are an unusual shape. That's because of the family that wood betony is in. It's in the Scrofularia um, uh, family. And that's the same family as snapdragons. So, you know, if you have snapdragons at home, they're very intricate looking um, uh, flowers. So this is uh, wood betony and they'll be blooming all the way up to the top for the next two, maybe three weeks. So look for, for them out in our woods, just starting to open up right now. Well, we've got a beautiful rock outcrop right here. This is a nice greenstone basalt outcrop. When the road cut came through, uh, these are on both sides of the road. And we've got some beautiful little early spring native wildflowers here. This is early saxifrage and very tiny flowers. It's a member of its own family, saxifrage family. And look where they're growing, right on the rocks. You don't normally find the early saxifrage right in the middle of some you know, deep, rich, woodsy um, soil. They're, they like it right on the rocks. And look at beautiful little mossy bed that they're growing on. So that's the favorite habitat of the saxifrages. Um, saxifrage is a Greek name, and it actually means rock breaker. So you might think that this little tiny plant is trying to break the big rocks that it's growing on, but actually uh, there were saxifrages that were, um, you know, named many, many years ago, even before, uh, you know, they were found here in North America. And they were used medicinally uh, to, to work on uh, kidney stones. And so those were the kind of rocks that were being broken by the medicine that was made by this plant. So saxifrage, the rock breaker, uh, entirely different meaning than what you might think. But when you see a, a ledge like this, especially one that's got a seepage area behind it, you can see how drippy, how wet um, this, this ledge is, this rocky place is. That's why the moss is so happy here, nice and vibrant green, because it's getting a continual flow of water and that's going to help form a wonderful um, kind of a nest area, nice little bed for the uh, early saxifrage. Just above the 
saxifrage is you find this beautiful succulent um, plant. It's not blooming yet, but it will have uh, beautiful pale pink flowers on it not too long from now. It's, it's a later spring bloomer, and it's called Allegheny Stone Crop. Uh, once again, you can see where it's growing right in the cracks and crevices on rocks. So you'll see these all along Skyline Drive when you, when you drive uh, through an area that has a big bouldery uh, section or a cliff section. Um, look for Allegheny stone crop and uh, it's pretty distinctive. It's, it's a, if you grow sedum at home, it's related to those uh, horticultural plants, um, very, very similar in leaf and uh, just a beautiful, another member of our rock-loving plant community. This is one of the prettiest spring wildflowers you'll see, one of the larger flowers. This is wild geranium, and it's the largest member of the geranium family in the park. This one happens to be growing in a crevice in the rocks, which is a little unusual. Normally you find wild geranium growing right in the, in the soil like this, but it's a tough little plant. And uh, it can actually get pretty tall. It could be a foot or foot and a half tall on those stems, but beautiful flower, um, five petals. And they've got those bee runways, those lines on the petals that direct pollinators straight to the middle of the plant where the pollen and the, the nectar are going to be. And so those bees are going to follow these lines on the petal straight inside and you might notice that the anthers those are the male parts with the pollen on the end are sticking right up so that's going to rub pollen on any pollinator that comes by there and then of course when they go to the next flower uh, they will uh, rub some of that pollen off and and that uh, flower gets pollinated what's cool about wild geranium one of the many things i like about it is that you know we think of pollen as being yellow and normally it is but on the wild geranium it's blue or kind of a purple so take a look a close look at the next wild geranium plant that you that you come across and see if you can't see that purple pollen on there For coming along on our virtual wildflower walk. Please join me again next time as we continue our celebration of our native woodland wildflowers here in Shenandoah National Park. Until next time, this is Ranger Mars saying see you.